Welcome to Zoom Back Camera, everyone, the online film forum of the University of Notre Dame's Browning Cinema. At the top of every show, we do have a statement that we like to say, and I like to read it in order to get it correctly, so I'm going to go ahead and do that now. During these uncertain times that have moved us out of the physical Browning Cinema and into a virtual one, our thoughts are with those battling the virus, battling isolation, battling precarity, and battling the fear inherent to this moment. And alongside that, we want to extend our thanks and appreciation to the first responders, medical professionals, grocers, childcare workers, public transit workers, and anyone else on the front lines. Zoom Back Camera is a small thing to offer, but we do hope these conversations about movies we love hmm, <laughs> <laughs> will buoy your day and continue the education, fellowship, and dialogue with which we bracket our films in the Browning Cinema. And if you are here uh, in the chat for the live stream, please do say hi, let us know you're here. And if you have questions or comments along the way, um, I have that pulled up and we can do our best to attend to them. Uh, with that, uh, we want to welcome our guest today, Grace Watkins. Hello, Grace, how are you? Hi, I'm good, how are you? I'm good too. Uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are and what you do. Yeah, so I'm Grace Watkins. I graduated from Notre Dame in 2017. Um, and then I went and did my master's in US history at Oxford. And I've actually stayed on for the DPhil or the PhD there. And I'm doing, focusing on carceral history and specifically the history of campus police. And what was your entryway to, oh brother, or brother. <laughs> 
Oh, brother, we're <laughs> it's a long, now. It, like, it looks really good on paper, but then saying it's kind of a, a drag. Right, you're um, shorthand. So I'm, I definitely was familiar with the soundtrack before watching it, because um, it was something we listened to growing up. And I think the, the soundtrack is fantastic. And then the movie's like an extended music video <laughs> sort of thing <laughs> for, for the soundtrack. But then I, I would have I watched it sometime in high school. Um, and probably watched it a couple of times then and then not not again until recently when I was uh, I kind of pulled it out again um, for some research that I was doing but I kind of listened to the soundtrack ever since I first heard it yeah and are you a fan of musicals generally as I I think this could be classified as a musical yeah I I am I'm not I'm definitely an, a novice fan but what I lack in you know, knowledge I make up for with enthusiasm. Um, <laughs> I definitely like imprinted like a baby duck on Phantom, Phantom of the Opera when I was like eight. <laughs> <laughs> I had the, the two CD set. <laughs> um, nice. And so, yeah, I really enjoy them, but usually ended up not seeing, not ever seeing the musicals, but listening obsessively to the soundtracks and mm -hmm. kind of filling in the plot, <laughs> mm -hmm. listening to the lyrics intently. Mm -hmm. And well, let's before we get into the film itself, let's do. Uh, we like to set the table with some either or. So, just general preference to films that might be in similar orbits on various planes with this movie. So, <laughs> you haven't seen a lot of Coen Brother movies, right? Oh. Uh, but the ones you have, do you prefer Oh Brother, Where Art Thou or Hail Caesar? Oh Brother. Definitely. No Country for Old Men or? St Stole a Brother, yeah. Uh, True Grit? A oh, Brother. Okay, so it's your yeah. favorite Coen Brothers movie. <laughs> I, yeah, I think so. <laughs> it's not saying much, but it, it, it is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. No oh, Brother, We're Out Thou or Apocalypse Now? I think Apocalypse Now, but I haven't seen it in a long time, so. I could watch it again like I did with Oh Brother and then want to change my answer, but yeah. I was in, uh, I was at a film festival this summer, last summer in Bologna and they had Apocalypse Now playing in one of the uh, palazzos. And I, I came from a dinner, I was running late. I was like, oh, I'm gonna miss the, I'm gonna miss the, like the, the movie. And I showed up <laughs> right when the Ride of the Valkyries was happening. <laughs> I was like, oh, I timed it perfectly. And it was bouncing off these buildings. I was like, oh, this is- That's just all you really need to hit in that one, yeah. <laughs> That's the movie right there. Um, okay, uh, Brother, which is now my shorthand, or Grapes of Wrath. I think Grapes of Wrath. And lastly, Brother or Jesus Christ Superstar. Answer carefully. Definitely Jesus Christ Superstar. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Out of there anyone that you named, that one wins. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so uh, let's hop into the movie here. Uh, we learn at the outset that the film is based on the Odyssey. The Coen brothers famously said they had never read the Odyssey. Um, any thoughts on it as adaptation or its use of that narrative or myth generally? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really clever idea in, it, in its execution, who knows, but, you know, like we were talking about with Apocalypse Now, you know, with Heart of Darkness, this idea of taking these kind of classic texts and then throwing them into a totally different historical context and not adhering to them too strictly can produce really interesting results. Um, that being said, you know, I think, I think that if they wanted to do it, there are a lot of things in the Odyssey that would have been so great to incorporate like missing Sears or kind of any woman with like more than one like any woman with an interior life who seems to be you know doing anything I think that would have been amazing um but I mean the film was the film was amazing for the for the bluegrass scene and continues to have a huge positive effect for so for all of its sins that that is a really tangible thing that it's had but yeah, and that's, uh, when you're saying there, you know, how they are loosely adapting from the Odyssey, and this is something we'll probably yeah. talk about at various points, 
they're also loosely adapting from history. Yeah. Uh, they're loosely adapting the South. There's right. a lot of pastiche <laughs> that's happening. Yeah. Um, and even the, the film, Preston Sergis's film, uh, Sullivan's Travels, that they're, they're working off of. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's, you, you learn it, you forget it, you rewrite it. And there's, there's fun to be had there. It's playful. Yeah. Uh, in the, uh, also, along with that, I'm curious, are you more of a book person or adaptations? I think it's an annoying film answer. adaptations. I yeah, say. yeah, no, I, I really, I tend to liking both. If I like the one, I usually like the other. And it's like Twilight. And it's like, how do you choose? You know, like, the, they're both amazing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, it's a lame answer, but I really, I do like both. Mm -hmm. And we'll be talking a lot about the soundtrack along the way. Mm. And the first song we get over top of the credits is Big Rock Candy Mountain. Are you a fan of that song or at I least it's it. performed here? Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> and they're using the original recording from like 1928. Um, mm. So yeah, it's just fantastic. And it's it's doing a good job of setting up for the movie with the, the cops with wooden legs and the jail made out of tin. The lyrics are great. Yeah, I love it. Um, we, that was a song, we had a very peculiar American songbook that we used throughout grade school music class. And it was like, it was half, we would sing like half, like uh, this land is your land, right. kind of like Woody Guthrie type songs, yeah. right? And the other half was like uh, hippie nineteen seventies Catholic hymns, <laughs> like though the mountains may fall. But another mountain movie or mountain song, Big Rock Candy <laughs> Mountain, was in there. And every time we would sing it, we would get this like, or each year we kind of our teacher would give us this lecture on the life of. Um, transient people and the language and oh, and it was great because it's like wow. oh I, <laughs> I, I, I it was it was like a rival it's like I want to learn that language I want to be able to right. talk it even though it's like cuneiform no one's using it <laughs> <laughs> and the song is like 300 verses so there's a lot <laughs> you know there's a lot to get from it it's a big mountain. It's a big <laughs> mountain. There's a lot going on there. Right. <laughs> and at the outset, after uh, we get the the credits, which I think are important because they set they set the feeling that this is a 1930s film as well. That right. the the form is inhabiting the era that it's set in in a lot of ways. Uh, but and I think this is the reason you are revisiting, oh, bro oh brother, I'm gonna call it <laughs> brother, uh, was some of the prison treatment mm. that's in the film. How do you see where it's placing us and the work that's happening there? Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting because it, as, we, as, as you said, it's kind of tenuously connected to reality and it's a satire. But what's interesting, what I was thinking about is that usually satires at least have a couple of serious moments that are very intentionally placed. And I'm not, I, I, I have a trouble finding any really in this movie. Um, but one of the, they, they, like, they like pulling in things that actually happened in history and then kind of wiggling them about. And one of them is that the, they're escaping from Parchman, which is the, the oldest prison in Mississippi. Um, when the state was kind of moving out, at least in name, moving out of the convict leasing system, although it continued in practice, they had to build actual prisons. And so they bought a plantation called Parchman Plantation that became the prison. And so um, that's, that's why I was revisiting it. Um, but there's a sense in which uh, when it's being silly and it's not taking anything seriously, and it's kind of, like you said, reforming history, there are ways in which um, these kind of insidious misunderstandings about how incarceration functioned in the during the depression in, in the deep south in Mississippi specifically um, actually becomes a way of minimizing the conditions there. Uh, the, 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 the first scene is you know uh, there's one guard watching a chain gang and then the three white members somehow break off and slip off very easily and 
Um, so it's rooted in reality where you, you would have one guard watching a line of incarcerated men working. That's because, you know, parchment was called the prison with no walls because it was set on 18,000 acres and there are no trees to hide behind. And so escape was essentially impossible. You could, you could walk for days and still be on the plantation. Um, and so the idea that you could just rock up and, or leave whenever you wanted to with a, you know, fairly easily um, is, is misrepresenting kind of the, the features of parchment as a prison mm -hmm. I, is what I was thinking as I was watching it. And that, I mean, they're, they're wisely for a film that is trying to be lighthearted, not hanging out there too long. Right, yeah. <laughs> But then they're using, you know, they're using audio of actual people who are incarcerated at Parchman singing in that first scene. And obviously, you know, it wasn't until I revisited that I had any idea that that was actual audio. Um, it ended up being that the, the one person they could identify from the recording got some amount of royalties from it. They had to track him down and, and give him the royalties. And he doesn't even remember making, he didn't remember making the recording, but he was like, okay. <laughs> took the money <laughs> but it's you know that's a very serious thing that's a you know really remarkable historical artifact that's just kind of thrown in there it was, it was, to me it was really yeah I was kind of reeling from it mm -hmm. yeah. um do you know uh someone's asking do you know David Olshinsky's Worse Than Slavery Have yeah yeah yeah. That? yeah that's yeah I definitely don't know much about Parchment, but what I do comes from him and this other guy, Hopper. And it, it, there's some really new, fantastic scholarship coming out as well about Parchment, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And after, so we dip into there. And then, as you said, we have our three main characters um, Ulysses, Everett Ulysses. Yeah, subtle. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Pete and Delmar, who are on the lamb and looking for treasure. Um, do you like the like the the plot that will be pushing us through Depression Era South? Yeah, sure. It's it's doing a lot at once. It's like kind of road movie, kind of yeah, like, like you said, on the lamb and treasure hunt and quest for home, and then within you have the political campaign going on in the backdrop. Um, but it's the, the film is kind of, you know, put into all these different little episodes so well that you can kind of have it be all those movies at once, I feel like. It sets up well for <clears throat> the, I mean, it's a movie where I, <laughs> I did rent it and watch it properly. I was almost <laughs> thinking, oh, I can do the Fandango like clips on YouTube oh, yeah. and pretty much like catch the moments that I need. Like, yeah. It's a, it's a loose glue between them. And it's often, you know, in, in fact, there there's little glue. It's, oh, yeah, now we're down on our luck. Right. We got to steal a yep. car and get moving again. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And to that, fortunes rise and fall in this movie. And uh, like, well, like many satires, it's, you know, it's right. the wheel of fortune is itself being satired. Um, do you, uh, the, one of the first highs and lows is getting their shackles off. So they're able to move freely, but then danger comes again in the way of Pete's brother turning them in for the bounty, which will become a theme. Right. Uh, do you like the roller coaster element, the ups and downs? Yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of soothing. <laughs> you know, someone disappears, they'll be back again. You can like count on that. And uh, you're never too worried about anyone. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you make of it? I I like, well, it gets into what the Odyssey is doing because it's right. creating set pieces. And in order for a new scene to emerge, you have to have stakes change wildly, right? And that's going to drive, well, you need stakes to change in any story. If they're right. changing wildly, that's where you get your Paul Bunyan's, your great American myths and your great Greek mess as well. Mm -hmm. And so I appreciate that it is channeling something that is 
very old, but still a big part of what we see in the films that it's aping as well as, you know, movies right. the way Fast and Furious goes about. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, um, and it's, and because it is so loose, you, you just learn to not get tense. I'm someone who gets overly invested in movies oftentimes. Yeah. And the anxiety for me doesn't ramp up in this movie the way it might in, in other ones. Right. But I do like this, this, you're saying how it's a music video. Do you <laughs> like the, the, the music video for, as I went down to, as I went down to the river to pray, this would be the, the baptism scene? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> it's, you know, I love how the, the plot will basically just stop for these songs and then you'll just be kind of watching it go on for a while. I think, um, I mean, they use water a lot throughout and this is kind of the first time we see it with the baptism, but it's a beautiful song. Um, and watching it is just kind of, with all everyone dressed in white, kind of culty, it, it's a, you know, it's just a spectacle. Um, and then I love how afterwards, you know, the, the two get baptized and then Everett's like, he's the only one who's still unaffiliated because um, <laughs> you have two are baptized when he's sold his soul to the devil and then he's just kind of in limbo. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I love that scene. The, and this is, I, I, when we have the songs come in, you also tend to see the components of the shot and it tends to be people mm -hmm. acting in ways that um, when it, we get heightened surreality, right? right? And it's not necessarily played for confusion. It's just, okay, this is, this is the act and the marching toward the river and the everyone being fixated and not interacting yeah. is really, really pretty too, so. Yeah, it's gorgeous. You couldn't have paid me to go in that river. I mean, I was thinking of shooting, it must've been horrific. Like. You keep, the water is just mud. <laughs> I wonder if this is, maybe this is part of the, because this was one of the first films to go through a digital correction and then back to film. Oh, wow. And uh, it, it, because that's as that's happening, but it was still in a moment where 35 millimeter film is being used in mm -hmm. cinemas. Uh, so I wonder if part of the color correction was maybe looking at, maybe making it murkier. I don't know. Mm, right. Yeah. I hope so, because for those poor people who are in it. <laughs> but it's also, that's the first time they really introduce religion, which they kind of keep returning to. And you're, you're kind of grouped in with Everett and wondering whether you're the one, who, the odd man out, or whether they're all ridiculous. And they, they keep it pretty open-ended the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they, there's the, the ending with the cow, where it's like, oh, there is a space for magical realism in this. Right, which the Oracle guy predicts mm -hmm. in his little spiel at the beginning, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they are, they are living with, they are living within a controlled universe. Right. Uh, is, um, that is, that has something, is that something's playing with it, um, which makes sense because they're not giving us the real South. They're giving us right cell jar version yeah. of that. Like if you had two like high school juniors who took like AP US history and then gave them like an astronomical budget create movies <laughs> about what they remember from AP US history on the depression, they're like, well, it's got to have the Tennessee Valley Authority. <laughs> that's that's it. <laughs> You know. Right, and this high school is in the north. <laughs> right, yeah, something, something, white populism, something, TVA. <laughs> uh, so you mentioned they meet up with Tommy, who is one of these composite figures of uh, the, is it Tommy Johnson? Mm -hmm. and, Tommy. and Robert Johnson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's he's inhibit or he's inhabiting kind of that space although not right. him directly right um and he 
he has sold his soul to the devil and does mention about the Everett, Everett's construction. For someone who's bound in rationality, Everett's <laughs> construction of the devil is like <laughs> what it would be like on a cart, like a, a, ma- a high school mascot, like devil. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what do you think of Tommy's uh, manifestation or how he describes the the devil in this? Do you well, remember? I, like, I'm I mean, I, I felt like they were trying to set it up to have a lot of overlap with the sheriff with the creepy glasses, um, which again is not super subtle. It's like we know, <laughs> but they don't they don't give you know they don't give Tommy's character a lot to work with, um, which is a shame because he delivers like the best musical performance in my opinion of the whole movie. And he's one of the two or three, I guess, characters who are based on real people who had really interesting lives as well. And in his case, he's like you said, kind of the composite of two real people who both used the, the kind of myth building of having sold their soul to the devil for, to, to kind of build up a hype around their music. And it's interesting that the, in the in the movie's case, it's it's pre, it's kind of portrayed as more of a tragic thing, like a you know a sad thing that's happened to him, but not too sad. Like we're not dwelling on it, but just in the background, you know, he's in some way doomed. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's a lot there's a lot happening there. As Miss Go from that time, like that kind of irreverence is amazing and. For hype, I love it. <laughs> I I know, yeah. <laughs> They're just like, that's why I'm so good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing hype, <laughs> I love it. Um, so getting their their performance that we then have is they go to the radio and mm-hmm. there's a, a difference between old timey and black music that's put out there. Right. Which the film, and we can talk about this maybe sometime later, but the film really confounds what what is right what these fields are. Um, but the biggest song from the soundtrack is "I Am a Man of Constant Sorrow," um, and uh, an allusion to uh, Ulysses, which translates to that, um, and. Are you a fan of the song? And generally, <laughs> what's old timey mean? <laughs> I have no idea. I mean, the whole the whole movie is a kind of like white historical fantasy. So it's whatever they think that is in in the in the way that it's presented in the film. And I think kind of consistently throughout there are these kind of quick references to the idea of like a fallen south like when one of the campfire scenes they're in the kind of ruins of an old you know plantation mansion um which is again super subtle uh so uh kind of trying to harken back to that and I think I mean I think that also partly attributes to why it was so successful when it came out You know, I've seen a lot of people discuss about how, um, you know, the the depression was something that they grew up hearing about from parents or grandparents in a way that kind of relates it to family history. Um, And then the movie kind of runs like almost like a a tall tale that gets told through families and also like what the kind of imaginary produces when you think of like how how the depression manifested in the rural South. Um, as for what old timey means as contrasted to anything else, you know, it, it's unclear. <laughs> that's something to do with ice blocks. <laughs> that's all I know. It's like carrying ice blocks is old timey. That's old timey. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, here's a a chance to maybe, well, well here, yeah. So coming into Pappy O'Daniel who then shows up and we see that there are a couple of points where the South coming into modernity is is an important storyline like it Mm -hmm. is on the AP history test. 
And that includes his mass communication, <laughs> mass communicating. Uh, <laughs> how do you, do you like Pappy? And, um, and then I'm going to, I'm going to throw an odd curveball your way. So okay. but thoughts on Pappy. Pappy, I mean, he, he holds your attention. The whole procession, like his poor son. <laughs> he was just trying to help. Um, yeah, I mean, all the like AP US history memories kind of like are floating in the background. <laughs> You're like, okay, you have your reformists and then you have the kind of incumbent. He's also, you know, he was a real politician who then becomes a composite of a lot of different figures and the sorts of moments that they touch on are interesting. They have um, like, you are, you are my sunshine being used as a campaign song when that was a song that was used by a governor of Louisiana as a campaign song. And then they have him pardoning the three heroes, which is something that the governor of Texas did for a, for a musician. He wrote a song asking to be pardoned. So he, he's an interesting figure. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, a, and a corpulent one too. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> do you, so this comes out in the fall of 2000 and I, I, I need to play. So you were how old at this point? Roughly? Not very. <laughs> You're not there. I would have been in kindergarten and first grade. Okay. So you don't, so the 2000 election, does that have, you have, is that like your first election that you remember or it was that? Too? Yeah, definitely. The, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember being sad. <laughs> Just like very abstractly. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that, that's about it. It's a, I, I, I would like, I would like some polemical article out there that says like this movie changed the election. <laughs> <laughs> because I do, I, I think there's, I, I mean, we probably can't, I mean, that's a claim a person couldn't make, but has a very, had a very interesting following at the time. Yeah. It had a way of like glossing over a lot of Southern sins and it mm -hmm. had a very particular portrayal of the South that was much more Bush than Gore, even though these are, um, well, Gore's home state bordered Mississippi and Texas is right there. And so I, I do think that there is in it some, some type of like apologist streak that could have influenced the race. I don't know. <laughs> I want I want someone I want someone to make the outlandish. You want someone else to make the argument, and then you can just <laughs> yeah. It. It. yeah. <laughs> but it's a if you go back like and it. you if you watch the films that were active in cinemas in October of two thousand, you get like this. You get the Contender, which is the Joan Allen movie where there's like the deep fake. Um, photos of her uh, when she, uh, of her doing something illicit or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I, I feel like this had, this had a certain appeal to people mm -hmm. that allowed an embracing of Americana that runs right historically. Yeah. So. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, don't know. I just had like a vivid flashback to you're asking about what I remember from the election and the only distinct memory I have is getting in like a playground argument with this girl she's like well my mom voted for it I was like well your mom shouldn't have and that was <laughs> that was the extent of it we both were like like you, we both hit the point where we maxed out on what we'd heard at home <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't have anything else left to go on and we we're both like we're both six so <laughs> gonna those, leave it those, there those dinner table talking points right, right exactly here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, along with so looking at Papio Daniel Daniel's ad and just pushing out his his message do you have a favorite political ad a commercial or anything that you remember well I love I love all the ones that are just super drama which is most of them but my most recently did you watch the the who killed Malcolm X series that it just put out on Netflix. 
No, I haven't. But, but yeah, so it's all about, you know, trying to track down like who specifically shot Malcolm X and they have a pretty good idea who that likely was. And he was just, you know, hanging out in Newark. <laughs> but it was this open secret that people in Newark knew that it was him with the notable exception of Cory Booker who put him in one of his reelection ads. <laughs> like his, during his reelection campaign, he filmed an ad with him shaking hands with the guy who probably shot Malcolm X. And then they did this, like very recently did an interview with him where they're like, did you realize that he, who he was? And he's like, what? <laughs> it's just, you have to watch him like process and then like immediately go into like politicking mode. Like, well, allegedly, um, you know, but you have this one <laughs> glorious moment of like just genuine surprise and dread. <laughs> That's probably my current favorite campaign ad. I now need to go check that out. It's, it was the best <laughs> moment of the series. <laughs> nice. You can see him computing. <laughs> Yeah, and, and like computing, like just how deep in it he stepped. <laughs> right. <laughs> Political life they show flashing the between my like, eyes. You know, he was like going for plausible deniability, and there was like there was him shaking hands. And he was like, hmm, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> the the next moment into like quotation marks history is <laughs> the arrival of Babyface Nelson who, I mean, he's the, I, I think he's the mo, he, he's like the, the least composite person in the movie. Like he's, but he is right. the same way. Like right. he was never in the South. He was right. a Midwesterner, mm -hmm. Midwest. Like he wasn't in the South. I remember that. <laughs> um, but, and much more unhinged than I remember. I forgot, like, I forgot about the cow killing. Yeah. <laughs> That was that was a rough one. <laughs> it just makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and thoughts on celebrity criminals, the Bonnie and Clydes, the Dillingers, yeah. things like that, how they've worked through. Um, you, you're a fan. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Do you have a favorite or what does it say to you? And also someone's noting, Cory Booker, also a Rhodes Scholar, like you. Uh, yeah, he is. <laughs> um, you know, well, the, what I'm so curious about is like um, Babyface Nelson's wife, who was just like along for the ride. <laughs> like she went to prison for a year after he died for like basically harboring was the thing I think that they were able to get her for. But she wasn't participating in anything. She was just like, yeah, I really loved him. So, you know, that was his profession. <laughs> and she, so th those are the things I usually get interested by is like kind of the, like all those folks kind of had like a cult personality around them. Yeah. And, and the minutia be behind the myth. Yeah, yeah. So I find it, I find it really interesting. Um, and it obviously relates to, there's kind of a, a funky moral code going on. Um, throughout them because obviously the cops are the bad guys as they're framed in this movie but then they I mean it, consistently throughout like they have a kind of uh context dependent moral code <laughs> you know um like the paying paying for the the pie that they steal off the the windowsill and then in the next scene they're stealing a car and it's like you know I, I kind of love it um <laughs> and you like you like baby face you you're like definitely afraid of him um and they had yeah the 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 his departure is really something too when he's you know presumably going to be sentenced to death and is really loving it um yeah that's the and that's that too like i forgot that he comes back like at the end of the right, film he just randomly pops up again um yeah, but yeah, and it's a striking scene even to, like each time they're in front of the fire and they're kind of reckoning with what their lives have become and how everything sucks. Uh, you know, you have it the first time with the hard time killing blues with Tommy and then the second time with the baby face where he's kind of manic all day. And then when he hits nighttime and is looking at the fire, he, he kind of becomes despondent. And... Mm -hmm. 
Or the barn yeah, so burnings, the cross burnings, the yeah. I mean, the, the I don't know what they torches. Shot, probably wasn't a single wooden structure left, <laughs> you know. By the time they were done, <laughs> so this, it's a fire-heavy movie, you know. Yeah. Barns were harmed in the making. Of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I do. I, I was going to say, along with the the criminals, I do like. And someone noted this in the the comments. Uh, that you hear the, uh, the, there's always the local like touch to it, you know? So like Al Capone would hang out at Martha's Midway in South Bend or, you know, like towns love yeah. building into their history that myth, yeah. which is just a little bit of naughty. And uh, that I think uh, is a funny thing that people, connect to but yeah yeah but it's also the the fact that there was something um and i think it's i think it's i think it's important to not that we're going through a depression but i think we will start to see kind of we will start to see people in defiance who are lionized mm -hmm. in the way that these people were during these economic times so yeah Good to hang out there for a minute and just think about why do we yeah like them? <laughs> right because there's a sense in which yeah i was thinking about that because it's the the older they are the easier it is to kind of romanticize their lives and um you know when, when they're not an active threat to anyone <laughs> any, anymore or when the target was specifically these kind of like old-timey cops that you know are seen as separate from the general population um yeah, that's a, that's and, a, a and an ex post. I mean, and the laws no longer good. I mean, pro prohibition was cast right. aside, and so maybe the there will be this reconstruction of yeah, you know, like weed dealers and gangs from the eighties and nineties in a way mm -hmm. that that might match some of this. We'll see. That's really interesting. Uh, you did mention the context dependent moral code. I, I do like when they steal the pie and he yeah. leaves cash. Uh, what flavor of pie would you steal from a windowsill? Um, like pecan, key lime. I mean, if I'm in like a pie stealing situation, I probably wouldn't be too picky. <laughs> you know, I'd no, probably no, be sure. really excited to find any pie. Um, just as like a novelty, even like that's, I've never seen anyone leave a pie on a, is, is, is it to cool off or like to like show people you made one or it's to cool uh, off? To cool off. Okay. Yeah. And to tempt people. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. To them to sin. <laughs> <laughs> and mobility in this movie is, is great. The way they run, the way they hop on cars in various mm -hmm. ways. At this point, there's a kind of a Beverly Hillbilly truck that they they ride. Have you ever picked up a hitchhiker or hitchhiked yourself? I'm not sure I've seen a hitchhiker in the like, you know, thumb out sort of. No, have you? Have you? Have we you picked one? up we picked up a hitchhiker, and it was raining, and we were in rural South Dakota. And his name was Jumpin' Johnny Joy. <laughs> and he, I remember he was, we were in a minivan and I had a friend with me and it was all, I mean, it was, it was kind of tense, but he was fatty <laughs> and he was a former singer and he was doing the talking for us, uh, which is, which is nice. He had the gift of gab, but at the end of the night, uh, or at the end of the ride, we dropped him off at his house. And he said, oh, one second, I'll go get a headshot and sign it for you. And he went in Cheers. the house and everyone in the car was like universally yelling at my dad, get the hell out of here, like, go, go, go. Uh, but he waited and we got the headshot and I um, still have it. It's like, it's like incredible. Okay. Yeah, jump with Johnny Joy. Wow. But it seems it's, a, it's an interesting thing. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's part of that. Uh, like, I, I don't know when it ends, but like most things, I assume this is 
like the 60s or the 1970s rise of stranger danger mm. is influencing hitchhiking I don't yeah. do you know that history well, I don't yeah there were actually I think even before the the 60s there were um at least at, I read about this at Notre Dame even that they they put a, a clause against hitchhiking in the student code um because that was a pretty popular way of of you know, getting around and people, folks in town were finding it irritating and the, the school is finding it irritating. So they started cracking down on it and the students were like, you know, long live hitchhiking, we must hitchhike. <laughs> but then <laughs> the the code went out and it slowly fell out of practice. Um, so it was against Duloc to hitchhike? I don't, don't quote me on it, but there were several schools I looked at and, and it was definitely hotly debated at Notre Dame at least that, you know, uh, students were hitchhiking and they weren't supposed to be. Um, oh, well, and I suppose the the taxi, big taxi, yeah, the big South taxi Bend. is like what the hell, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's maybe <laughs> that's conspiracy two of the day. <laughs> yeah. Seeing uh, the election, <laughs> ending hitchhiking, yeah. Yeah. cultural impact of O Brother. <laughs> Uh, the next song that we get is the Didn't Leave Nobody But the Baby. I think it's the title. Yeah. Thoughts on the pretty direct quoting siren scene. You like it? Yeah. I love it. That's, that's a, like, at least for me, that's a, the, the scene I think of when I think of the movie. And it was one of the few dim memories I had from watching it in high school for whatever reason. Um, Obviously, I'm a huge Alison Krauss and Emmylou Harris and Jillian Welch fan, so just hearing their voices is, is cool. I remember being really impressed that when they get closer to each siren, their voice gets a little bit louder on the audio. Just, I don't know why I was like floored by that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is, it's like you're there. <laughs> um, well, it's, I, you're there and you're not, because this is the, I, I mean, keeping with that weird liminal space of history, but a historical, right. um, which is, I mean, the word gets kicked around a lot, but it like is aligning with a lot of like postmodern retellings, uh, is the fact that people are lip syncing to non-diegetic songs. So they're things that are potentially not happening in the world and they're singing them and then they're becoming in the world but mm -hmm. it's so obviously not the case yeah that there's no attempt to make it feel real right um, like a lot I, of things in this movie yeah and I mean I don't I never understood I mean I only recently grasped that they were you know basically drugging them to get to turn in one of them for probably ransom but how they know that they're and why they only take the one if there's probably bounty on all three i don't know is pete the easiest to carry <laughs> you know like i just oh, don't yeah, understand that would, they, couldn't, <laughs> um, they couldn't do all they kind of lost the plot on that one but aesthetically like it's a gorgeous scene and you're in the water again um yeah not cleaning my clothes in that water <laughs> <laughs> well yeah that looks like a not an effective way <laughs> are they just kind of like slapping their <laughs> to the beat right so that yeah the world interacting with the music too uh i think it might be my favorite song from yeah this, by the way mm -hmm. i yeah, think it's so gorgeous the next so we get back to back we get a couple of the more direct quotes from homer and that is big dan teague the uh cyclops john right. goodman uh, who's a Bible salesman for people who are looking for answers during this time of yeah. woe and want. I, I'm going to start, I'm going to, woe and want are going to come out a lot during the pandemic for me now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you seen, have you seen uh, The Righteous Gemstones out of curiosity? No, I haven't. John Goodman plays a televangelist. Who oh, chills movie. religion? He knows how to. He knows how to do it well. Uh, <laughs> do you like this scene? I do. Yeah, I think he does a great job. You know, we don't get we don't get any men being turned into pigs, but we, we get a frog out of it or a toad or whatever he is. Bless his heart. And <laughs> Horny toad. Yeah. <laughs> <Shame>. <laughs> 
Uh, real, real low common denominator yeah. and some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was slow on the uptake with the Cyclops too. I'm I'm ashamed to say. I was like, okay, he's wearing an eye patch. There's got to be a because you have two blind men. So at a certain point, I'm like, we're doing something with sight. I don't know what it is. <laughs> This is like the level of analysis I get on movies. <laughs> like I see that that is important. <laughs> but then I, yeah, I clocked that he was the, the Cyclops. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, we have uh, Pete then is tortured. Yeah. And anguishes over turn coding, cries for forgiveness, you know, goes, uh, goes far away before he. Uh, gives up the goods ultimately does yeah uh, which is a moment of solidarity and there are moments of so excuse me sorry solidarity in the film and just popping through a couple of things there is the political rally for homer stokes with the great lines uh, no cronyism nepotism or rascalism <laughs> Beautiful. There, there are a Which lot of good one-liners. You have to give it to them. Are you someone who can quote movies? Not, you know, not too much, but there are ones that stick with me from, uh, especially the little kid, the hog wallop kid in the beginning, um, pre like first barn burning, I think. I think the first barn to go um, when he's talking about shooting <laughs> the census man, <laughs> people serving papers and all that is great. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to remember cronyism, nepotism, rascalism. <laughs> uh, <laughs> get thrown around during various elections. Down the line. Like a, a salaried son of a bitch. That was another one that like <laughs> just like was immediately seared in my brain. <laughs> mm -hmm. After the rally, uh, Everett meets his um, Starla, Warby McGill who is going as Penny. That's real Penny. Right. I think they just yeah. make her Penelope. I don't know. I know. Whatever. Yeah. Other than that, they're strong on the names though. Mm -hmm. I love the names they come up with. Mm -hmm. And a great fist sight, the old tiny, like, like Conan O'Brien, like right. country. <laughs> <laughs> and a stay out of Woolsworth, my favorite line of the movie. That's uh, so good, yeah. <laughs> we then find them in a, in a movie theater, and this is actually, I think this is a close quote to Preston Sturgis's uh, movie, but yeah. it, there is a, well, you need Pete to be able to connect with them again, uh, but you get the prisoners almost like shuffle dancing into the prison on what is a field trip. And is that, did that strike you as odd or what did you, pull from that and what well, was happening yeah I was struck by it because like as you said it, there's an almost identical scene in Sullivan's travels and so I'm curious you know whether that was common practice in places like Parchment at the time I mean I do know that they wouldn't have been Pete wouldn't have been with that crew because they would have been segregated um I think it they it was originally just black men in the prison and then by the 20s they had added in white men as well and then women um, but they were all kept in different camps within the kind of massive compound that is the the plantation um but i think it, it does you know demonstrate that the the borders of the prison were much more porous than we kind of commonly think of prisons as being and they've obviously become less porous as time has gone on but uh, that is a, an oddity that kind of stu stood out to me. Uh, Do you know when that tends to shift? I think it's just, it's a gradual process uh, from what I can, from what I can tell. Um, and then obviously as you get the, you know, the institution of like super maxes and things like that, they become, you know, it's written into the policy, but then it, it's depends on which access you're looking at as well. Like if you're looking at, uh, for me, I'm researching like the history of prison visitation. Then it's not it's not actually a linear kind of line of it's becoming always increasingly more restrictive. It's actually kind of gone up and down in terms of restrictiveness over time, depending on who's in charge and what sort of kind of galaxy brain argument they've come up with for 
either restricting or expanding access to families. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, the the uh, they then break Pete out of jail, right? Um, just like again. that, you just rock up. <laughs> you just, you know, that's yeah. They keep it moving. <laughs> <laughs> part of the good part of it, and Everett cleans, comes clean on there not being any treasure, and before they can really go to blows over it. They are, they happen upon a clan rally. Right. And it is, it is, it's played for last. Yeah, it's played for last, but it's satirically done. Does it, rewatching it, did it hold up? Did it change from when you had last seen it? What were your, what were your thoughts I with this one? Apparently repressed it when I first saw that because I had no recollection of it when I was rewatching. Um, no, I think it, I mean, it's a total mess. <laughs> and there's this, I, you know, the hope is that if you're going to present it in that way, then you're going to, you know, show that it, the way in which it's funny is, is showing how ridiculous all the, the ceremony and the costumes are. Um, but they don't, they don't quite hit that. And there's also, you know, in the framing of of the creation of the scene, apparently like George Clooney has been joking for years about how they were using a military brigade in order to get those really precise kind of formations they're doing. And there are a lot, a lot of black men who were in the troop that was hired for it. And, uh, you know, he jokes that for them, it was a real trip to be, to be, you know, acting in that scene, but it's also just is totally, totally hectic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The uh, <clears throat> so the the Busby Berkeley style that it's doing, which is kind of the human ornament, and I I'm a sucker for that. Like something in my like lizard brain is like, <laughs> oh, this is amazing. So I like I had not forgotten it at all. Uh, like that is like something that I remember very well is right that, in their their motions and movements. Yeah. Um, it did, um, I thought it was also, I thought it was goofier than it was. In my mind, I had it more slapstick. Yeah. Than kind of what it is. And that, yeah. and Oh Death, which is another song that I really like. Oh like, yeah, I, it won I a Grammy, a I think, yeah. Yeah, now I was like, I don't know if I can have this in rotation quite as much. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's odd. Yeah, but, no, it's it's really something. I mean, it does do a good job of showing, like, I appreciate that you have all the different characters that you've been interacting with throughout the movie. You know, Big Dan shows up and uh, Homer Stokes, right? He shows up, um, which is, you know, if they're trying to show what these people's lives are actually like <laughs> or, or what their estimation of it was is that they were also deeply racist. Um, and then you have, I mean, you have the second instance of the um, of the three heroes kind of doing this weird thing with race where, you know, they're first trying to pass as black with the blind uh, Mr. Lund, the radio. And then as soon as he's like, I don't like that, they're like, oh, that's good because we're not, you know. Mm -hmm. And then the second time they're trying to escape and they're putting the, whatever that is, is it the pomade they're putting on their faces? Something. Putting something on and then they do, you know, as soon as I saw that, I was like, what is going on? So I just don't remember it from, from when I watched it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I don't have coherent thoughts on it. <laughs> the lizard brain thing is, yeah, it's accurate. <laughs> it, it, it awakens something. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, the major set piece scene then follows where uh, it is a Homer Stokes rally and we get everyone coming together. So this is finally Ulysses attempt to, or will be vanquishing the people who have tried to take over the castle when he's gone and Penelope and what's the matter with mm. And Papio Daniel is there and a whole bunch of things. Yeah. And we have a, 
we have pardons, political spectacle, thoughts on the last scene and how it plays for you today. Um, equal mess to the, I, I really good with all movies. I, I love the, I love the beginning. Like I love the setup before there's anything really pressing that needs to be addressed in the first couple of like little adventures. <laughs> and then, you know, whenever things escalate, you know, they lose me a little bit sometimes. And so this is definitely a case of, um, especially when they try to infuse any kind of like coherent mo morality into it. You know, it just feels like, like what are we doing here? You know, when they're all booing Homer Stokes out and one of the takeaways like racism is bad and I'm like thank you for that <laughs> but it's not that they just want to hear the song so it, it's just totally incoherent as well I don't I don't follow it really I love the song <laughs> yeah it's a, and I like it in jailhouse now and I like oh yeah and that's the that's the actor singing right it sounds like him yeah so and I like you are my sunshine like those are the great <laughs> another great song yeah we need more music video and less plot. Uh, it possible. does. I mean, it is. It is ultimately somewhat. Um, it has a a pretty fatalistic message about politics. Yeah. yeah. And potentially relationships and family too. <laughs> right. uh, but I do like the, I, I do like the kind of the underbelly when Pappy turns back to them and says like, you know, you're, isn't that right boys or whatever. Um, but it doesn't, I don't know what it's necessarily trying to, to tell us other than um, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't have a good. I don't have. <laughs> I'm not compare. sure they did either. No, that's a really good point too about the um, kind of fatalistic, like the futility of politics. Right, you spend the first half being like, well, the reform is probably slightly better, and then he's you know leading the show at the rally, and you're like, oh okay, and then you know, then you know that Pappy's still awful. So then you're just like, well, they both suck, and and then <laughs> you know. And then the heroes don't really care either way. They're just kind of like, they're pardoned. They're happy about that. But they're, it's totally divested from their lives. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's a great, uh, it's, I like movies where it is about putting on a show and having that. the audience get excited and yeah. the confusion over their excitement because <laughs> right. they haven't, they've become the Beatles and they're not even aware of it. It's, right. That's pretty great. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so then, and then I, again, I forgot in the Baby Face Nelson's loop completes after that. So you get the high, high of them being pardoned and free and reconnected with Penny. And then you see a perk walk to an execution with music and its own spectacle. Yeah. They sit next together in an odd way that I didn't crack the code today upon rewatching it. But <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it led to some electoral changes in the year 2000. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> um, last last song that we get is "You Go to the Lonesome Valley," which always sits with "Oh Death" with me. Right. And how do you like the, the, the last act? Once we think we're in the clear and here's one last big heavy swing with a big do sex machina. Yeah, I mean, that's where it kind of, I mean, recovers a little bit from, the song is stunning. Um, and I think that's another case where the, the actors are using it. That's the, the actual Fairfield Four, I, I think. Again, don't quote me. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a striking, it's a striking scene. And, and you want that resolution with the, the cop that's been chasing him this whole time. 
and I'm, of course given what I study I'm always interested in like movies treatment of the police and what they're you know they're not like the, the, the guy is like supposed to be the devil incarnate but that's more related to him as a person and not the profession the way that I take it like they're not making any you know the police are definitely the baddies in the film but there's there's no big political statement that I'm taking away from their their depiction as the devil like they don't they don't make that connection there and there's even this kind of reformist bent that you know it's it's a force in need of professionalization because you, you have the guy talking about how the law is a human institution and you know they're, they're saying we're pardoned he's like well I don't care um and so I, yeah I was I was struck by that um and then you have the final kind of water use in the movie with the the huge flood am I I'm worried about what happened to the poor the grave diggers because you can read it as like, well, it's washing away all the evil, but there are also these poor guys are getting like, where did they go? <laughs> um, yeah, those shovels will not make flotation devices. No, yeah, they don't have a coffin to. <laughs> yeah, or the basset hound or whatever. Like, yeah, not his fault. <laughs> yeah, you can't get you can't get too wound up in it, but <laughs> it does make you it does make you a little bit nervous. Right. Um, and then the oracle's whatever premonition. Yeah, comes it gets wrapped up all nicely. Yeah, mm -hmm. the cow. Yeah, tough, tough movie for cows too. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's no like cow rescue effort that I'm seeing. No, I. Uh, he learned to swim. He got away. <laughs> right. I, 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 read, I, I saw the deleted scenes. Right. And the basset hound is riding him on his back. It's <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to worry Beautiful. about it. Right. Uh, the last moment is uh, Holly Hunter uh, rejecting the marriage because it's the wrong ring. Yeah. And anything on that? I felt like they could have done a lot more with her character. Like they had Penelope in, in the Odyssey is a really interesting and complex character, I think. And her son is a really interesting and complex character. And they just, they, you know, with Penny and then the girls, they're just not, there's not much happening there for me. And they, they kind of use the, her as like a nag for, for jokes, but I think there's more that they could have done with it and, and it would have been still funny and engaging. Um, maybe that's just wishful thinking, but. Um, yeah, it's not, um, yeah, it's not, a, if you're looking at gender in this movie, there's not a lot, oh, yeah, to, no. a lot to. <laughs> for, yeah, the treatment of just about, just about anything. And the supporting characters that pass in and out are usually the most, for me, are the most striking and the most engaging and who I wonder the most about as fun as the three heroes are in their in their own ways but I think it's the the little um pit stops that you know that people remember too yeah and that's the the way you find this in in movies you had your 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 leading people and, and here it has like a three stooges kind of construction too right um, but then you would have the kooky cast of featured players who come in and out. Yeah. And are very broad and playing things in this vaudevillian way. And they do it here and it, it, it works. And I think that that's when it's at its best. That's also when you're getting music. So <laughs> oftentimes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So anything else on uh oh brother we're out though that's that's about everything i've got yeah. yeah i think that's that's about it i um it's interesting seeing so real quick just like personal history this was a huge this was something that you would hear in the dorm people playing the soundtrack it was a it was one of those dvds that was kind of on a loop mm -hmm. it had a big footprint and it's surprising to me that it hasn't had the revisitation that some of the other Coen, brother, Coen Brothers movies had. 
for as big as it was in the moment, it seems to have died down more than Fargo or yeah. Raising Arizona or the other comedies. And it will be, I, it's interesting to see if this just doesn't age well because of various things that are in it. And maybe it already hasn't. And that's why yeah. the, the half-life is shorter than one might have expected. I was, yeah, I was surprised to see that it's like, it's 20 years old now as of this year. I think, I mean, yeah, I, I think it's real strength is the soundtrack, which is still getting a lot of play. So maybe that's the only thing that really has lasting power. Um, mm -hmm. You saw it in college for the first time? Uh, yep. I, yeah. I went to, um, which one? I went to Chippewa AMC. The one really? The South one. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was, it was an outing. <laughs> and I, I tried to go to uh, movies with some regularity and mm -hmm. That was a good get off campus movie, yeah. which is a big deal when you're a first year student <laughs> to get to see the world. Yeah. And I, I, um, I didn't, I, I didn't fall in love with it, and I was shocked that people loved it as much as they did, <laughs> and then weren't as interested in watching. So, like, I was a like a. Fargo is only four years out at that point mm -hmm. and that really spoke to me bordering Minnesota and I right. <laughs> and there was an interest in like people going or watching Fargo or quoting it like people were quoting it all the time in the way you would like a Bill Murray 80s kind of wow. type movie. Like but, he's a suitor or like what what was getting quoted? Tight spot, paterfamilias. Yeah. Like, things like that. Okay. Um, and it was it's this kind of it, it plays to a certain goofy machoism mm -hmm. that I think a certain sect of that you find at Notre Dame. <laughs> and it, like it, it hit that groove. And combined with the fact that it was this bridge into Black culture while very safely coming from white culture, mm -hmm. makes sense that it would play yeah. in certain areas uh, yeah. effectively. I find that like, the Andy Griffith show hits like the same sort of like dopamine receptor in my head <laughs> as a brother. Yeah. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, well, I mean, you get prisons, you get the, yeah. like, they're always walking in glens and nature. Yeah. <laughs> Hollers. <laughs> you get fantastic music. There's really good music on the Andy Griffith show. Um, he had a great voice. He could yeah. sing. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, that is going to uh, wrap up Oh Brother Ratho. But before we go, uh, we do have a questionnaire. Were you aware that Proust had a younger sister named Becky? Yes. Oh, great. Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Becky created. <laughs> Missed my cue. Witness, slightly. <laughs> uh, Becky created a five question questionnaire to determine if you love movies that is scientifically valid. Do you care to take it? Love to. Oh, here we go. What was the first R-rated movie you saw? So I think I think it was Once. Oh, the which is Irish everyone just surprised that Once is rated R. Yeah, <laughs> it's very Irish, a lot of language, <laughs> but that's a very wistful first R-rated movie. It was a good, and I'm I'm a gentle soul. I can't take very much. <laughs> Okay, what movie would you be compelled to buy, even though you may already own a copy of it, if you found it at Picker's Paradise for two dollars? So I think um, Kiki's Delivery Service. I would, if I can find anything related to it, I'll hoard it like a like a gerbil. Um, I, yeah, I love it. So I would definitely pick it up, even even though I already have a copy, and even though I don't have a DVD player. 
<laughs> you still need to like own it for like you know in a post-apocalypse scenario <laughs> oh, for the icon yeah of it that was one of the last movies we showed in the browning before was it pandemic shut down oh yeah. i was hot i missed it, was, it. Uh, professor finkel funder sunday family film um, what is the best movie to watch on a second date? Well, I feel like, so the second date has to be like, that's like the litmus test time, you know? Um, so I would show like Tomb Raider. Kind of best reactions. <laughs> I love Tomb Raider. <laughs> and the, is this the original Angelina Jolie not the Alicia Vikander no, not reboot. That. No, yeah, the the original or the sequel. You know, one like, watch the first. Is that the one you're recommending? The with Angelina Jolie. Oh, sorry. Of the like the seat like because there are three of them. How many did she make? I think there were. I know, I'm thinking of the first, and then the second is with Daniel Craig, right? I've my mind's like morphed them all into one like really excellent movie. <laughs> it might have been a third. I haven't even seen the the reboot. I don't trust it. Did but. you play the game? No. No, just movie. just, just a, an admirer. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your favorite toppings to put on a pizza? You know, I love a like a, a cheeky jalapeno here or there, uh, some mushrooms, basil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite movie to watch while eating a jalapeno mushroom basil pizza <laughs> on the couch? Really you put all the toppings together, but separately, I think they're good. <laughs> um, I think like The Princess Bride is a fun one to kick back with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to be eating pizza during some scenes because they're gross yeah, out for if me. If you have like the rats, then maybe that's like, you know, you finished your pizza eels. by then. You've had time the to eels. The eels, true. Yeah. Yeah. Some people have their jaws. I have those eels. <laughs> no, that is, yeah, it is really scary. That that was see, that was something that like it was too much for me watching it. Like even I get really, I get like sweaty. Just now thinking about the screaming eels helps me like <laughs> not wanting <laughs> to wash my hands. <laughs> Thinking about that. <laughs> Dr. Rag on your answer. That's a very good pizza movie. Okay. Well, I no, just no. want to be very no, careful of what I'm eating. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Okay. So you are 10 years old and you receive a screener from the future. What film most blows your mind? I mean, so it's hard to come up with anything that would have like completely traumatized me when I was 10 just because I was such a wimp about everything and still am but like like something like the favorite would have totally blown my mind but I shouldn't have been watching it um but maybe like Emma, the new Emma that just came out I would have liked the colors on that that would have really I would have been impressed with that because <laughs> it's beautiful to watch but, mm -hmm. but. so 1800s England <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been kind of my niche. Yeah, that, that was a right when I was ten. That was right around when the the Keir Knightley Pride and Prejudice came out. That blew my mind. Ah, uh, then yeah. Emma, the new Emma, totally would. So yeah, great. Okay, let me do the calculations. <laughs> Add this. I'll put it SPSS, spitting it out. Hey, they get points off for Princess Bride. <laughs> it all like it all. It's not points off. It's just it's a composite. <laughs> And it turns out you love movies. Hey. I'm thrilled. <laughs> and we loved having you here on Zoom Back Camera. Thank you so much for joining us. And Thank you so much. Everyone have a great night. And we hope to see you for our last two tapings, which will be of Out of Sight and Adventure Land. OK, have a great night, everybody. And we hope to see you here back soon. Bye-bye.